Thomas Jefferson's legacy is one of paradox, the triumph of civil liberties and democracy, but the tragedy of division and racial marginalization. America is home to one of the oldest and most consistent democracies, but is plagued by a persistence of racially tainted polarization. This reality was embodied by Jefferson, and this reality manifested itself on August 12, 2017, in Jefferson's hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. Thomas Jefferson was born in 1743 to Peter Jefferson and Jane Randolph in Colonial Virginia. Jefferson deeply admired his father, who grew from a surveyor to a planter through his hard work. Perhaps because of his upbringing and education next to dissolute and unproductive classmates who simply inherited their power and wealth, Jefferson loathed the aristocracy. Ten years before Jefferson's birth, the Molasses Act was passed by Britain, marking the onset of British tyrannical rule over the colonies. After the French and Indian War, British despotism redoubled as Jefferson ascended to prominence as a skillful writer. Jefferson began secretly favoring independence in June 1775, far before the American public was ready to contemplate secession. When Richard Henry Lee of Virginia finally proposed independence in June 1776, Jefferson's distinguished talent as a writer meant he was chosen to draft their Declaration of Independence. Jefferson rose to the task magnificently. He drew his ideas from Enlightenment ideals, John Locke's concept of the social contract, and from English Whig's anti-authoritarian values. Jefferson took the ideas and magnified them. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson's ideals defined a nation without precedent, a nation that created an epic whose influence rippled far beyond the establishment of an independent nation, a nation that held the promise of individual rights and democracy. After the war had been fought and won, Jefferson turned his attentions to Virginia's legislature. Jefferson believed that one of the most crucial steps in sustaining republicanism was providing for wider education. Enlighten the people generally and tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. He drafted a bill to provide free public education for all white children in Virginia. However, the measure eventually failed. Jefferson charged the wealthy class with an unwillingness to incur the expense of educating the poor. Educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. Much later in his life, after his retirement, Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, explaining that this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow the truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error so long as reason is left to combat it. The university broke radically from tradition by establishing itself as the first secular university in America. Even more important than education, Jefferson believed land reform was the most crucial defense against tyranny. Jefferson scrutinized Britain's imperial policies endlessly, concluding that an aristocracy of wealth was of more harm and danger than benefit to society. Jefferson was convinced that aristocracy was eminently shackled to land ownership. Jefferson argued that a society composed of economic equals was the best way of realizing republicanism that was to the good fortune and happiness of all its participants. He believed that the living should not be imprisoned in the traditions of the dead, and he understood that only the abolition of old and conventional land ownership laws could overthrow the aristocracy and redistribute the political power in the state. I would rather be exposed to the inconveniences attending too much liberty than those attending too small a degree of it. Jefferson championed liberty and equality and criticized the aristocracy, but the freedom-loving planter was, in fact, a part of this privileged elite. I have sworn before the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. This quote, inscribed in the rotunda of the Jefferson Memorial, captures the memory of Jefferson as the founding father of individual rights. Yet this forefather of justice and independence bought, sold, and owned other human beings. Jefferson was not immune to the hypocrisy of his arguments against the ruling class, and realized that, in holding slaves, he was imitating their shortcomings. Jefferson's original declaration contained a passage attacking the king over slavery, condemning it as a violation of the sacred natural rights of people. Although Jefferson did consistently oppose slavery, he accepted conventional racial stereotypes that African Americans were inferior to whites on the whole. 
I advanced it, therefore, as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. He wished to abolish slavery and remove freed slaves from the state, justifying his belief by saying that two races could never live together in harmony. Jefferson also believed that slavery hurt poor white people, and that the abolition of slavery would weaken the aristocracy. Over his lifetime, Jefferson held over 600 enslaved laborers. These people built the University of Virginia, the monument to Jefferson's intellectualism, and worked the fields of Monticello, Jefferson's aristocratic home. In 1782, Thomas Jefferson's 33-year-old wife, Martha Jefferson, died. Jefferson's bereavement was so violent and constant that many feared he was suicidal. Two months after Martha's demise, James Madison, a close friend of Jefferson's, persuaded Congress to offer Jefferson a position in Europe to get him out of his isolation. Jefferson jumped at the opportunity for a change in scene and was in France by 1784. In 1785, Jefferson decided that his daughter, Polly, should join him in France. Sally Hemings, 14-year-old enslaved daughter of Betty Hemings and John Wales, Martha Jefferson's father, was sent to look after the nine-year-old Polly. Jefferson planned to send Sally directly back to Virginia as slavery was illegal in France, but instead, he illegally kept the enslaved girl with him. Little is known about her life in France, however. Sally later averred while sailing back from France at 16, she was pregnant. Most historians believe that over the rest of Jefferson's life, he maintained a sexual relationship with Sally Hemings, and that all of Sally's children were fathered by Jefferson. Only four survived to adulthood, all of whom were freed. Sally, however, never was. We have the wolf by the ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. Thirty-four years after Jefferson's death in 1826, American democracy crumbled under the issue of race and slavery. Jefferson's beloved Virginia became the capital of the Confederacy, their ideals standing in stark contrast to the notion that all men are created equal. In 2004, Obama delivered a groundbreaking speech at the Democratic National Convention. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. George W. Bush's speechwriter, David Frum, wrote in Trumpocracy that Obama's speech leaves history with a troubling question. Was Obama right or wrong in 2004? Are we still one people even if we no longer speak one language, or share one religion, or any religion at all? We are inevitably, invariably, irretrievably becoming more diverse societies. Um, there is no going back, whether one likes it or not, whether one embraces it or not, that's a reality. And in response to that, we are seeing a pushback from those who claim that, that national unity has to be based on race, ethnicity, or language. Political scientist Daniela Allen asserted that the simple fact of the matter is that the world has never built a multi-ethnic democracy in which no particular ethnic group is in the majority and where political equality, social equality, and economies that empower all have been achieved. This is the challenge of American exceptionalism, to create a truly diverse, truly democratic society. Jefferson set the stage with his political philosophies of equality in the idea of civil rights and liberties, but also characterized the racially driven tribalism which America has been wrestling with its entire life. Jefferson's intellectualism triumphs in the university founded, and his ideas of equality live on in American hearts and minds. But Jefferson also left another legacy behind, a tragedy epitomized in another group of people. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. When senseless acts of tragedy remind us that nothing here is promised. We're showing to this parasitic class of anti-white vermin that this is our country. This is my town! We did not want the mother... This country was built by our forefathers. It's sustained by us. History remembers we lived through times when hate and fear seemed stronger. And now we got bodies on the ground. We rise and fall and light from dying embers, remembrances that hope and love last longer. I've sometimes asked myself whether my country is the better for my having lived at all. And I do not know that it is.